Greetings all. Welcome to another session here of Tuesday Talks. Today we're going to be investigating literacy instruction for English language learners. A lot of this information is coming out of that book right over there, uh, entitled the same thing, Literacy Instruction for English Language Learners. It's an excellent book and I do recommend that you uh, investigate it. You may be able to go buy it at Amazon or some other bookstore online. Today we're going to be looking just at the beginning of this text and some of the ideas therein, mostly focusing on foundational issues. We'll look at some of the issues related to second language learning in the school systems and a uh, little bit of uh, investigating some issues related to literacy development. And then we're going to take a focus on something that I think is one of the most important, and that's getting to know your students. Uh, very important if you want to be able to teach them and have them succeed in language learning. One of the first things that uh, they talk about in this text are some of the big ideas that schools have to remember and schools have to focus on when they're preparing to teach second language learners. One of the first things they talk about is the length of time it takes to learn a second language, and that is definitely a big issue. A lot of people think that learning a second language is so real difficult, and you hear a lot of people talk about that. In point of fact, it's not difficult at all. It takes time. And that's the biggest issue I think that people will have. There's a lot of hours that are required, far more than a typical college student will take, uh, will uh, receive in a public in a college. And uh, certainly for second language learners in the public school system, they need a lot of hours in order to move up the mastery level. Another thing they talk about is uh, the fact that second language learners are very resourceful. Um, there may be people when they see a second language learner think that they don't have a lot of experience or don't have a lot of knowledge when in point of fact they might have a lot of information. It's just hidden under a layer of non-language, non-English. And so part of uh, your bounty as a, as a language teacher is to go find out what all these rich uh, resources that these second language learners uh, possess. Um, so it's a, that's a, another big idea. Another thing that's very important uh, that they talk about, uh, basically they're saying that language and culture are inexplicably intertwined. Now you cannot separate language from culture or culture from language. When you learn language, you are by default learning culture um, and vice versa. So as a, as a, a teacher, uh, you're going to make sure that you're going to be teaching them culture as you're also teaching them language. And the opposite is also true. If you're going to learn about them and you're going to learn about their language, you need to learn about their culture also because they go hand in hand. Um, lastly, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about classroom-based assessment, um, and this is uh, basically using uh, uh, assessments as a way to identify where your students are, what their strengths, their weaknesses are, what they know, what they don't know. And so classroom-based assessments you can do often. What they're talking about with classroom-based assessments are assessments that you do in class during class time. Uh, another word would be formative assessment. Um, but there are things that you do on the fly in order to gain information about who they are and what, what they know and what they don't know. That's not just related to language, but also related to content. Again, they are a resource, if you remember. So we want to look uh, at using different types of assessments to figure out what they know, what they don't know, what they need to know. Uh, other areas that they focus on in the textbook include uh, the idea of literacy development. We know a lot about literacy development. Uh, and they don't go into a lot of details in the text, which I'm glad for, but they do mention that there are a host of skills and knowledge base that people know when they get involved in literacy. They understand, for example, that this squiggly line is a letter, and this letter is uh, associated with a sound or a variety of sounds. And they know how to read words, and they know how to read spaces, and they know how to read groups of words. And uh, so there's a whole bunch of skills that are involved um, with literacy. Literacy involves both top-down and bottom-up processing where you identify the little pieces and yet there are at times and there are other times where you identify all the the big pieces so you've got top down and bottom up processing that's involved as you're reading uh, as you're writing okay those things are going on constantly and a good language learner can do both at the same time i know that when i'm talking with somebody and i'm trying to figure out you know we're going along and i'm understanding all the big stuff at the top and all of a sudden we'll come to a word or a phrase or an idea that i don't understand all of a sudden whoosh, i go down to the bottom and try to figure out what the idea is by figuring out all these little things down here at the bottom and try to build up to the main idea that's top down bottom up processing 
And so both of those things are going on when uh, you're when you're trying to understand or decipher messages, whether it's in written or in oral form. Literacy includes those things. So literacy development is going to include that as well. Now, so we realize there's a lot of things, a lot of processes, a lot of information that's going on in literacy development. For second language learners, it's even more complex. So second language literacy is a more complex process, right? Now, part of me says, duh. Well, it's more complex because as a second language learner, oftentimes people rely on their first language, their first culture, their first uh, literacy base in order to understand what's going on in the second, which of course can cause problems because it's not always the same. As they mention later on in the textbook, L1 and L2 development is similar in some ways. It's different in other ways. Um, so there are these competing things going on, which makes it more complex. So it's a little more difficult uh, when you're trying to deal with two different uh, sets of language. I always tell the story where I remember this uh, lady that I knew who lived in the United States. She was from overseas. All of her friends would come over and they would all speak her language. Her husband did not speak her language. He only spoke in English. And for some reason, her kids got the impression that uh, language was divided up into gender. So that when a man walked into the room or walked into the house, you know, some man would visit her, they would always speak in English to the, to, uh, the guests. And whenever a girl came, they would always speak in their mother's language. Um, which is kind of interesting because, uh, you know, the development of it. Now, they had this idea that it was based on gender. Well, it's not based on gender. It's based on other things. But as you can see, it's complex. Okay? Now, what matters most in terms of language development is a person's ability. Is there, uh, is there a stage of development, both uh, age-wise and uh, language-wise? Uh, when I say age-wise, maybe someone is older, but their ability is lower. Well, they need to be treated differently as opposed to someone who is older and their ability is higher. Um, so things are going to mess around there. You as a teacher, however, want to be able to look at the most important aspect, which is where are your students? What is their ability and what is their uh, level of understanding of just general information? So getting to know your students means that you're going to have to be able to conduct some kind of a needs analysis. A needs analysis is just where you're going to figure out what they need. What are they interested in? Um, a why are they learning language? All of this is related to things like age. You know, people who are older are probably not interested in Teletubbies or not interested in uh, um, uh, Sesame Street. Um, they're interested in different types of things. And so we have to treat them with a more mature uh, material as they're learning, even though their language ability is low. Uh, what's their family background? Uh, what's their cultural background? What is the nearness of their language to the target language, which in this case would be English? Uh, it may be that the family is very much a literate type of family where they focus on language. They focus on teaching children early on how to read and write. Uh, even before the kids get into school, they learn, you know, they learn their characters or their letters uh, and their parents read to them so that this idea of a literature or a literate type of culture might be something that's in their first language. Maybe it's not in which case things are going to be different. Uh, what's the culture like? Uh, you know, and I'm knowing what their culture is like will enable me to interact with the learner more, more easily. If I understand you know, that there are certain ways of greeting, that there are certain ways of touching or not touching, you know, maybe you do shake hands, maybe you don't shake hands. Um, you know, are ways uh, that guys and girls, boys and girls uh, interact together. Uh, what, uh, uh, you know, the, the ways that you dress, or the ways that you, uh, uh, the way that you eat, you know, the way that you walk into a room. If I understand these things more, it's going to be, help me as a teacher understand who my student is and to better understand what their needs are. Nearness to the, the target language is another big thing. If a language is closer to English, it's going to be easier for them to learn by and large and uh, going to help them acquire language more quickly. 
because all the things that they've learned in their first language, their tricks and strategies and even vocabulary, they can pull in to the second language. If the languages are not close to one another, further apart, then some of these hooks and tricks and, and strategies may not work for them. I spent uh, about 15 years in Japan, and so I know a lot of Japanese words, and I loved it when Japanese words were very similar to English words, a little easier to understand. But there were certain words that were completely different, and I had to run across them in context uh, about a dozen times before I would begin to memorize and push that word from short-term memory into long-term memory. Uh, so nearness is going to be an issue. Next one here is their proficiency level. How good, how well do they communicate in the target language, which in our case would be English. Um, and uh, if they are doing a good job of it, uh, then it's going to probably be easier for them to move along into the higher levels. If they're starting out and they have very little, that's going, again, you're going to be treating them differently uh, in the classroom. What type of literacy training do they have? Is it just their parents? Did they get some from school? Did they not have any at all? Um, that's going to impact how you prepare for them in your classes. Also, what type of prior schooling do they have? Have they been in school? Do they understand some of the academic uh, requirements or don't they? Granted, those, diff those academic requirements will probably be different now that we're in a, a different culture, a different school system, uh, but still having that knowledge is going to be useful to you as a teacher as you get to know them to prepare for uh, teaching them and um, interacting with them in your class. Um, the authors then jump into what they called a literacy development model. Uh, and there are a number of models that are out there. They are going to focus primarily on, actually they, they have a few in their text that they're going to be looking at. I'm going to be looking at these four. Um, and uh, it's a, a model of language development. And really what uh, they appear to be looking at is what I would call a scope and sequence or uh, levels of language development uh, for people who are trying to master a language. And so there's the WIDA uh, model, there's a TESOL model, ACTFL model, and then Common Core. Uh, these are pretty much the major players, but to be perfectly honest, anyone can go anywhere and set up their own system of language development. And basically, a literacy development model, uh, theirs is going to focus on reading and writing, but you could focus it on, on listening and speaking as well as the databases, grammar, and vocabulary. And so you can have six basic areas that you can focus on in this model wh where you define what each level is, where you define all of the details that someone has to master in order to progress to the next level. Um, and that's what these are. I'll take a quick look at some uh, examples of these. This is the WIDA system. And uh, if you're interested, you can go look at um, their, their website here. And that's the address right there. Um, if you want to go there and take a look at the WIDA standard, uh, you come here and you can take, take a look at their uh, download library. And in here they have a whole bunch of uh, information. They've got some newest things here. They've got academic language related things. They have their WIDA standards, which are listed down here. <clears throat> and so you can uh, look at the standards that they have and the models that they're using. There's a whole bunch of information that's listed here. They've got PowerPoints here to show you uh, how to use their systems, how to use uh, their, uh, what's the word I want, how to use their uh, rubric uh, for all of their levels. And uh, one of the nice things about them is that it does go K through 12 and they do all six areas, uh, all six skill areas. Uh, and so this is the uh, WIDA, which I believe is the Wisconsin uh, system. I don't know why it began in Wisconsin, but the University of Wisconsin was very much heavily involved in this process. The other interesting thing about the WIDA system are the number of states that actually have adopted this, um, this standard. Uh, and you'll note there are a number of uh, schools that have adopted this standard. There are some that have adopted it, but that's the, all that they've done. And there are other states that have not adopted it at all because they're using a different system. So that's the WIDA system. Another system is uh, the TESOL system. Now TESOL is what I live in. Uh, TESOL, Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages, is an international organization. 
uh, that focuses uh, primarily on people who are teaching English to speakers of other languages. These are your standard TESOL, ESL teachers in your public schools. These are not your mainstay teachers who are teaching in the mainstream and have the additional um, responsibility of taking care of second language and bilingual learners. Okay, but they also have standards here. And again, you can go in and look at their guidelines, which uh, here's their website if you're interested. And uh, you can go get that information from their site. Um, but if you come down here, you'll see that they've got proficiency standards for uh, pre-K through 12. And it's, uh, again, it's broken down uh, by age and by uh, area of study. Uh, and so this would be the standard that I'm more more comfortable with and more more relate to simply because it's the world that I come out of. This is more of the linguistics uh, English uh, avenue. There's also the ACTFL standard which is a tremendously popular standard. Uh, they've done lots of research on the number of hours that are needed to learn a language. They've done lots of research on, um, uh, let me go show you their address here and this is ACTFL. Um, their standards are very very uh, famous because of the level of responsibility and level of work that needs to be done in order to, uh, uh, what's the word, in order to become an actful raider. Uh, one of the other nice things is this little graph here where they show you the different levels. They have, their levels are novice, intermediate, um, advanced, and then superior. And you'll note that their si the size of their responsibility of each student at these levels grows exponentially. Um, this is in terms of vocabulary or discourse and discourse um, ability. Uh, at the lower levels, it's easier to progress to the higher higher levels. But as you get to intermediate and then advanced, the responsibilities grow and grow and grow. It's more difficult to progress after you move beyond intermediate. And this is the way their uh, scheme works. Now you can again download their uh, their um, their model. And you'll see that for each one of these levels, they've got a variety of listening, speaking, reading, writing, grammar, vocab types of uh, skills and requirements that need to be done. Uh, and that's the ACTFL standard. <clears throat> so we've got the WIDA, we've got the uh, TESOL, we've got ACTFL, and then the last one that I wanted to show you was the Common Core. Um, Common Core is one that is being used in the state of New York, the state of California and Illinois. Um, and so that's the one that you guys are primarily dealing with. So it is a standard that you'll want to get to know. They do have a standard where you can print out and download. Again, it's, uh, they're dealing with the four major uh, skill sets, reading, writing, listening, speaking, and they're also dealing with the two databases uh, as well, and they have it broken down K through 12. Um, so as you're going through, obviously you can be uh, looking at that. But those are the different types of <clears throat> models that are out there. Um, Again, if you wanted to, you could certainly develop your own. These are primarily used within the United States, uh, except for T-cell. T-cell can be, is probably used in other places. I take that back. ACTFL is also used in other places because ACTFL is not just English. ACTFL is any foreign language. So overseas people use this more often as well. Uh, literacy development models. Uh, I wanted to give you a quick picture of what, uh, what is meant by hours of study. It takes a lot of time. That's the way uh, um, uh, the authors here, Cloud and Janessa and Hamayan, had talked about. Well, <clears throat> if uh, you're studying an English and you want to learn English, if you're in this group here, this first group, the number of hours that's required for you to get to a level three, which would be considered uh, an intermediate level of ability, it's going to take you 720 hours, okay, for an average person, actually for a superior person. Uh, it's going to take you 720 hours. Now think about the number of hours that your students study language, uh, and you'll realize 720 hours, that's quite a bit of language. Level two languages are more difficult and require more hours. Uh, so if you get up someone who's coming from, you know, Bulgarian, Urdu, Farsi, German, the number of hours to get to a level two, three is almost doubled because their first language is not, you know, Italian, Swahili, Spanish, or one of these other group one languages. 
Oh, by the way, this information is coming from the Foreign Services uh, Language Institute. Uh, and all of this was compiled and is recorded in uh, Omaggio's uh, text about uh, language learning. And I'll make sure that there's a link for it um, later on. Uh, group three languages are even more difficult. And you'll see that the number of hours is the same here. But getting to it is uh, oh, actually it's, uh, it's similar actually when I look at the two. Uh, but these should be a little more uh, difficult. Level four languages. Look at the number of hours necessary to get to that. So if you're looking at Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, or Korean, the, the amount of time to get up to those levels is much, much more because the languages are so dissimilar. Uh, it's interesting to note that next to English, the more popular languages would be Chinese and Arabic and Spanish. Uh, and so Spanish speakers are going to get along faster learning English than will Arabic or Chinese students who are coming to the U.S. to learn language. And that's all I have in this little series here. Again, the points that I wanted to stress were um, the need for us to uh, get to know our students, find out what their abilities are, what their interests are, and to recognize the, uh, the development, the literacy development possibilities that we have out there as far as the models that are available to us. I do thank you for stopping by, and if you do have any questions or comments, you can shoot them right down below. Have a good day now. Bye-bye.